Good morning, everyone. So, have you been uh, reading your Bibles? Today is the start of fifth week, and should be. What is our uh, memory verse today? Do you know what 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 is the memory verse today? For today, starting today, for this week. It's the same verse that we just read, right? So let's, let's read it again. Could you, could you uh, bring out the, the slide again, please? All right, so let's, let's read it again because it's starting today until uh, Saturday that is going to be our memory verse, right? So when you read, when you, when you uh, uh, memorize a verse, start with the passage first and then the, the verse. And then at the end, you have to say the, the passage again. All right, so let's, let's do it. Sephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you but we rejoice over you in singing. Sephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. All right, so that's, that's our verse for the, the week. Now, can you imagine uh, what would be like if God sings? All right, remember when, when God created the heavens and the earth, he just used a mere word, All right? He created the, the heaven and the earth and he used that. Uh, what, would, what would he create if, if he sings? Probably a new, a new heaven and a new earth, right? And, and basically, that's what uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 to 18 says. Behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and their people a joy. So when God spoke at the beginning, he created the heaven and the earth. At the end, after the last battle with Satan, the people will exalt God. And in his exaltion also, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. You can read that in, in Revelation if you want to, to uh, read that, right? Uh, when I think of the voice of God singing, what do you think? What, 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 is, what is in your mind, right? Um, I think that a uh, uh, booming Niagara Falls, and then probably uh, a trickle of stream from a mossy mountainside, you know? Uh, when my wife and I went to Niagara Falls and we rode the uh, Maid of the Beast, it's a boat that goes through to that, uh, close to the fall. When we were facing the, the fall, we just sang, our God is, a, is a, our, 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 our God is an awesome God. And we just were, we were just singing because the, the fall is so mighty. You can, you can feel the, the, the air coming from the falls. You know? but, but our God is still mightier. Amen. Still, right? And uh, what else? Uh, I think of like a roar of a lion or probably a, a purr of a cat. Right? So what I'm saying is huge. Probably when God sings, it's, you can hear it. Or probably you can, or do, you, can, you can probably not even hear it, or it's very, very soft, right? Uh, there's an example in, in the Bible, but like that, right? Do you know who, who that, that, that the person? That's Elijah, right? Right, when he was running away, when he was in, 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 in anxiety and depression, probably like that, uh, he could hear the thunder. But do you know why? Because he could hear his heart beating of, uh, of uh, anxiety.
Okay, so our ob objective today and through our lifetime, it should be our lifetime, our objective, is to hear the voice of God delighting over us and to hear Him say, well done and good and faithful servant. At the end of our race, we are running a mar marathon here, right? And at the end, uh, He's going to call us, right? You, would, you, would you like to hear him say that, uh, well done, and faithful ser servant? So my question to you is, how can God delights, uh, the, God's delight apply to you or to me? Right? Uh, so at the end of our life, uh, or, or even right now, probably, right? Uh, would God be delighted in you? So that's our challenge. From the passage we just read, what I would like to do this morning is to show you, number one, that God delights in his people, Israel, despite of their disobedience. And because of their disobedience, God turned to another group of people for the time being. And that, that uh, group of people is number two. And God delights in this group, we call this, his children, the church of Jesus Christ. And God does not end there. And number three, and because he delights in growing his family. All right, so let's, uh, let's uh, talk on number one. So the verse that we read a while ago, Sephaniah 3.17, referred to some as God's lullaby because he's singing, right? Your parents probably, they were singing for you before, when you were very, very small. Probably Gagayani Gabi, Rika will be singing with you, for you before. Probably Gabi, right? Right? So, uh, yeah, uh, this, this verse, uh, they, they refer it as the God's lullaby. Why would, sing for the, why would God sing for these people, for this stiff-necked people. What have they done to receive God's praises? Right? To, to appreciate this passage very well, we have to go back to the beginning of the book. If you, if you uh, Sephaniah is a prof prophetic book, right? It's talking about uh, Israel. What will happen to Israel at the end of the year, uh, of, 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 uh, at the end of time, or age, they call it after the church age, right? What will happen? So Sephaniah begins with one of the most dramatic declaration of coming judgment found anywhere in the scripture. Actually, there are three books that are almost the same, Jeremiah, Joel, and, and Sephaniah. His description of the calamity is about to fall upon Judah can be compared to God's judgment of the earth during the days of Noah. So Sephaniah, if you open up your Bibles to Sephaniah chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, I don't know if uh, it's there. So if you open up your Bibles to chapter 1, uh, verses 2 to 3, let me read. I will utterly sweep away everything. Thank you. Oh, my unity. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Here, so you can see here, the wrath of God against those who rebel against him in he is in clear display. Right? Those who think think such language is harsh, do not understand the truly evil nature of sin, right? If you want to read chapter one, you will see that, that they are really, uh, the sin is really, God doesn't want it. Can you imagine that uh, one of the sin of Israel is they, they sacrifice babies, and the baby, uh, they put it in a, uh, a very hot stone, and the, the, the baby will be crying. Right, screaming, and they would uh, have 
uh, uh, musical instru instrument to just drown the, the, the scream of the, the baby. Right? So that's, that's one of how, how this, this sinful generation was, uh, look, looks like. And God doesn't, doesn't like that. See, he, he wants to, to get rid of these people. But you can see that later at the end of uh, Sephaniah that God also wants to save some of these people. Right? Uh, those, so most of the book continues to al along the, this vein, this, this uh, gain, uh, the wrath of God is going to tell them what's the punishment, everything. So, uh, Sephaniah pronouncing prophecies of impending doom against Judah and against the nations around uh, Judah also. The final section of the book, now that is in chapter 3, verses 9 to 20, however, contains two prophets, pro prophecies of salvation. This is not unusual in the prophetic books, always in, in um, um, prophetic books, there are uh, impending doom and then there's blessing. So God pronounced uh, a, a calamity for them and then he also pronounced blessing. So it's always like that. So uh, he begins with a prophecy concerning God's purifica purification of faithful remnant. If you want to read it, let's go to verses 9 to 13, chapter 3. Because I want, to see, uh, I want to show you here that uh, God selects not all, but only a few people. Even right now, in our church, or in, in the whole world, He doesn't save all people. He only saves a remnant. And right now, in uh, Maspeth, probably here, uh, like us, and then there, are, there, there, there's, there must be some uh, other churches also. Not whole Mosfet, right? So even right now, uh, God saves a remnant. Even in, in, during their time, a remnant, a few people also is saved. saved. So here, uh, let me read verses 9, oh no, verse, verse 12. All right? So here, I will leave in your midst, in your midst a meet, meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. So from the, from the whole nation, God will leave a few people. They are meek and humble people. And uh, by, by my, my, uh, my, consult, my uh, co conclusion later, you will see how these people become humble or they become uh, part of that remnant, right? I'm going to, to show you later, right? And verse 13, sabi niya, uh, here, the remnant of Israel shall be no, shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a disful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down and no one shall make them afraid. Right? So th those are the remnants. Right? And right now, since I called you a remnant, right? It says here, they don't have, they shall do no unrighteousness. Right? So since you are a remnant, we should not be doing unrighteous things. Right? All right, so uh, here in verses 9 to 3, that's, that's, that's the, the selection of the remnant. This is followed by a prophecy describing God's rejoicing with his people. Let's go to verse 14. It says here, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgment. He has cast your enemy, the King of Israel. The Lord is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. 
In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion, let your hands be weak. And now you, the verse that we, we read a while ago, The Lord your God is your, in your means. The mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. So God here calls upon his people to sing and rejoice in verse 14. Then in verse 17, he also sings and rejoices over them. Now if you stop for a moment, right, and see here, the Lord God Almighty and creator of heaven and earth, the Holy One of Israel rejoices over the remnant. And like I said a while ago, if we are remnants here, God should be rejoicing in us. Right? Now I'm going to tell that again in my conclusion. I'm going to tell you how we're going to do that. Right? Uh, this is not an abstract God of the philosopher. Our God is not abstract. This is our God. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? Father of our Jesus Christ, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this God, the living God, rejoices over faithful remnant with gladness and singing. Uh, does this remind you of any New Testament passage? So let's go to my second point. God delights in his children. Consider this parable of the prodigal son. Prodigal son. Luke 15, verses 11 to 32. I'm not going to, we're not going to read that because it's very long. Let me just uh, summarize it for you. The father in this parable represents God. Says his prodigal son return, returning home and what does he do? He runs to him, embraces him, and kisses him. This was not something a dignified elderly Jewish man did at, did at that time. They don't run, this, this, uh, this uh, elder people during that time, because they have uh, sleepers and right? They use sleepers, they don't have uh, uh, shoes before, right? So uh, today, many fathers are unapproachable. Uh, I remember my father before was very, very strict. Uh, most children, they tend to go side on their mother's side, right? It's the same thing with us in our family. Uh, we tend to, we are more open to our parents so to, to our mother's side than our father before. He was very strict. And uh, whenever we ask something, we go to the mother first. Because that's, she, she is the, the Holy Spirit. So <laughs> we tend to go to, our, my, to, my, to my mother first before she asks for my... For, we don't go directly to, our, to my father before. Right? So I think, I think uh, some of you are like that also before, right? Uh, they don't stay ar around long enough for the children to get to know them, right? Many of them are refusing to accept their role as a father and have denied their children. It is little wonder that these children grow up with a clear understanding of God as father. See, if you are part of the church, right? Your role is to show them that we have a God Father. Right? If you're the Father here, right? Your role is to show them the God, God the Father. Right? So here, it is no accident that Jesus came to reveal to us the Father of all fathers. The love of the Father makes it possible for children to come Home, God is not like uh, others father today that hope they never run across their children, right? So some fathers li are like that probably. They don't want to, to get across their, fa their, their children. Something happened to the, fa to, the, to the son, they don't want to know. 
right? That parable reveals God who is searching for his children. It is not hard to come home for a father who desires your return. It's hard to come home to a grumpy, vindictive tyrant who has shown little interest and no understanding of compassion toward you. In 1 John 3, 1, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not, world does not know us is that it, it did not know Him. In John 1.12, but to all who did receive him, he believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God. So there comes a time that a much mature father must let his children go. He must do this even though he knows they are going to make bad choices, of course. If you're still stay, staying with your parents, you're 35 now, and you're still staying with your parents, uh, there's something wrong, right? You're married and you have children, you're still staying stay with your parents. See the job boy, that's enough. Then the, there's something wrong, right? Right? He must do this even though he knows they are going to make bad choices. This man allowed his son, right? The privilege of experiencing the hug pen. Uh, he was. Tending for pigs. If you read, if you read that, that uh, passage, the son, because he used up all his, his, uh, his uh, money, he worked us tending pigs. Take care of pigs. He, he ate uh, food of the pigs at, at the same time also because he was so low. He, was, uh, he lost everything. Right? So the father let his son do that, experience that. That is sure way to allow him to come to his senses. Our Heavenly Father has a way of bringing us to our senses too. Our Heavenly Father wants us to learn lessons from the hog pen that we can learn in any and no other way. Did you notice that the son was suffering as a result of a famine? Right? The reason why he, he doesn't, doesn't have any food anymore because there's, there was a famine. In Old Testament, God uses famine to punish people or to give them a lesson. Right? Uh, our Heavenly Father, gra grace includes hug, hug pen. So even, even that, eating food for pigs, that is also God's grace for that uh, young man. Otherwise, he would die. Right? Is there, is, uh, it, it is there that we discover the full measure of his grace. When you are very down already, and you're still not uh, submitting yourself to the Lord, right? He will really test you. In Proverbs 3.12, it says here, The Lord reproves him whom he loves, as a father the son in whom he delights. God corrects those he loves. Even his correction shows his delight in his children. Right? Jesus used this parable and other parables to tell us, There is joy in heaven when a sinner repents. It is not only the angels who rejoice, God rejoices also. Right? We can see that uh, in Luke 15, 7. To him be all glory, honor, and power. Thank you, Lord. Right? We should be happy. We should be glad if God uh, is, is uh, t testing us or uh, disciplining us. The word said, right? He doesn't he doesn't punish or he doesn't correct those he doesn't love. So if he, if he is uh, correcting you, he loves you very much. And this is our last point today. God delights in growing his family. And I have three points. Uh, very close. Very, very close to, to the end. 
Number one is God delights in His plan of salvation and His Son, Jesus Christ. We can read that in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. God was God, Jesus was God in human flesh, and He was the only possible way to save sinners. The sacrifices of the old were insufficient to save, but showed his need for atonement through a perfect sacrifice. The story from Jesus' birth through his perfect life to his sacrificial death and powerful resurrection is the glorious plan of God. He delights in what he has accomplished through Jesus and he wants people to move as he is. In Isaiah 53.10, it says here, But the Lord has pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. The father wasn't happy to see his son get, get so much pain. Uh, have you seen the movie? movie? But he delighted in his obedience. Knowing that good is good, it would do, and the honor his son would receive. What Jesus has done, uh, my, my brethren, is uh, for our salvation. He died for our salvation. Right? Uh, if you have not received the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not uh, put your, your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I encourage you to uh, do that today. Right? The father uh, wasn't happy that his son was in so much pain. Isaiah 42, 1, it says here, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom you, you, my soul delights. I have put my spirit on, upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Now, number two, God delights in seeing Sinners repent. Some people are convinced that Jesus is cruel. Right? I, a lot of people say that right now. And vindictive. Even enjoying seeing people die. The Bible paints a different picture. Right? There are, I, I, can, I, can, uh, I can read a lot of uh, comments about uh, uh, why does God kill the whole nation or something like that, even, even babies, even their, their flocks. He wanted to kill all those, right? And they said, because he, he, he is vindictive or something like that? No, because those are people that, uh, uh, they, they sacrifice people, babies, right? That's the reason why. Uh, Ezekiel 18.23 do I, do I have ple any pleasure in death of the wicked? Declares the Lord. This is what God wants. Rather than that, he should turn from his ways and live. God wants those who are wicked, who doesn't have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ yet. He wants them to return, to turn, to repent, right? And to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he wants. While God is just to pour out his wrath on the wicked and judge the unjust, he gives them time to repent. Because of his great patience and love, he will wait as long as possible, but after the person dies, judgment is appointed. All right? God does not rejoice when the wicked die because he knows they must be punished and he would rather they repent and live he wants all people to come to know him but he will not force their hand god has great joy when a sinner repents that's what uh, we, we read about luke 15 7 i tell you that in the same way there will be more there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than one over 99 righteous person who need no repentance. Right? 
So number three then is God delights in declaring his message of reconciliation. We need reconciliation with God because our relationship with him is broken. We have sinned, my brethren. When we just, when we were still conceived by our, our parents, we already have that sin nature. Right? You don't have to do anything sinful to become a sinner. You don't have to do anything. The Bible says that you are a sinner because of what Adam, the first man, has done. Right? From him, all of us are sinners. And Jesus came here to save us. He died on the cross to save us. Right? And so we are, uh, if you believe in what he has done, if you believe that uh, he, has, he has died on the cross, that he, was, uh, he is the promised payment for your sin, you will have uh, salvation. You will receive salvation. So that's what you need to do. All you have to do is just believe that he is the payment for your sin. That he is uh, the, the, that his, his death, his blood, wipe away your sin. Right? So God is holy and righteous, but in our sin, they separate us from God, from him. Sin made us his enemy. On the cross, Jesus took our sin upon him, satisfying God's justice. Jesus' death made it possible for us to have peace with God. That is in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20. All this is from God, who through Jesus reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God, make his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Jesus to reconcile to God. Now, if you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe what, what he has done on the cross, then you are a believer. You are a friend of Jesus. You are our brothers and sisters. Now, as a believer, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Right? That is, he uses us to tell the world that they can be those unbelievers yet, those who are not part of us yet, they can be reconciled to God through Christ. In that way, we become Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. The message we are to share with the world in this, be reconciled with God. Right? That's how the message of our uh, gospel. Right? We should share the gospel. That's the message of the, the, the gospel. It's reconciling people to God. We are to tell the people of the wonderful opportunity they have to make right with God through Jesus. We implore them. Implore as we put some force, right, to believe in Christ. Sins do not count against those who are reconciled with God. That is also in Romans. We are no longer condemned, right? Because God made him, that is 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who has no sin to be for us so that in him we might become righteousness of God. Now, every believer plays a part of this ministry of reconciliation. One plant, one waters, and God brings the growth. As we proclaim the gospel, we act as peacemakers, and God blesses us. We tell and live out his message of reconciliation. Lives are changed, and God gets the glory. Now, how are we going to do this? We've been doing this for the past uh, 
several days now. Right? The prayer of three. Now you can see that, that cross here, right? Starting from Monday, was it Monday or last Sunday? Right? We listed three names, but two. Yeah, two. And we let one, the third name blank. We left it. Right? So if you have not done yet, maybe uh, we, we do, we, do we still have a post-it? Lana? You post it? Yeah. Uh, who, if you have not done that yet, what we want you to do is uh, write down two names and leave the third one blank. We'll wait for, for the post-it. And then we pray to God that he will give you the, third, the name of the third person. Right? Then post that list on this, on this cross in front. Now today, you start praying for that, your list. Right? Now, after, after the service, when you pass by the cross, look for another list and pray for that list also. Right? So, Pastor. Okay. So, this is the po po post it. If you have not done it yet, write two names. You put your name and then write uh, one, two, three. First two, you put the name of your friend, office mate, anyone, and then the third one, leave it blank. Right? And now, uh, after you have uh, writ written the names, pray for it. Ask God to, uh, to give you the third name. If you don't have that yet, pray that God will put you, give you the, the, the third name. Right? And then uh, you start praying for that list, your list. And then when we're finished, go to this uh, cross and pick another list and pray for that list also. And then tomorrow, you start connecting with those people, your, your list. Right? However you're going to do, text, call, whatever. We start connecting with those people, right? Uh, we call that in in uh, in uh, in Lightcast uh, care. So for the first uh, week, last week, starting this, uh, last week, starting Sunday, we've been praying for these three list for these three people, right? Starting tomorrow, uh, you do your care. You start calling them, get connecting to them. Uh, text them, whatever, any, any method, right? And then uh, before uh, Easter, you share. So from that, from, from being uh, uh, just connecting, calling, right? Do something more, right? You probably go and buy uh, groceries for them. I don't know. So you're, you're, you're going to... to uh, do more. Bless them. Right? Bless them. All right. So uh, I, I hope you, you understand what you need to do. All right? Uh, so let's, let's uh, conclude then our, our uh, mass message this, this morning. So can you feel the wonder of this? Being God uh, singing for us, or over us. Right? Can you feel the wonder of this today? That God is singing over you. That God is rejoicing over you and loud, with loud singing. Right? But you say, the Bible said that God loves his own glory above all things. And that God takes pleasure in his own name. How then? And I'm going to imagine that he should be interested in me. So if God loves his name, loves his own glory... Why would, she, why would he be interested in me? Right? How can God's delight apply to me? If that is your problem, then make ready to sing. 
for the answer is given clearly in verse 12, right? We read it a while ago. For I will leave in the midst of you a people humble and lowly. That's the remnant. That's us. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. If you knew that God delights in his name above all things, and if you want to be enclosed in that joy and be part of the pleasure of God yourself, where would you go? Right? Where would you go? Where would you seek refuge? When you take refuge in his name, he exalts over you and with loud singing. That's the connection between God's delight in his name and his delight in you. Sephaniah alludes to that earlier, actually. I, I, I did not uh, point that verse a while ago, right? But now we're going to read it. Sephaniah 2, 3, right? Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his commands, seek righteousness, righteousness, seek humility, perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the wrath of the Lord. When he is saying this, what he is saying this is, anyone in the land who is humble enough to submit to God's command, here, here, here is what you should do and keep on doing. So if you are humble enough right, to submit to God's command, Stay humble, seek the Lord, and do righteousness. It's the same condition we can see in Second Corinthians, in Second Chronicles 7:14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked day, ways, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and hear their land. You know. Uh, most people says that it is uh, a pro prophecy for Israel. Yes, it is. But uh, we can also uh, get the uh, the principle here. So for for Israel, at the end of the age, Israel will finally experience God's delight in them when a nation humble themselves, seek God, and do righteousness. So before the Lord Jesus Christ comes, Israel will call on the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole nation, right? Not only Daniel. Daniel made a mistake. He was praying for the whole nation. And God said, hey, no, you need to not finish yet, Daniel. The punishment is not finished yet, right? But before the Lord Jesus Christ comes, right, the whole nation of Israel will recognize him. They will call on the name of the Lord. And that is the promise here. When they call on the name of the Lord, God will get his delight again in them. Now my question to you is, but for you, if you seek your own glory among men, truly you have your reward on the earth. Right? If you exalt your name among men, truly you have reward on the earth. If you bank on your own righteousness, truly you have your reward on earth. But if you humble yourself and seek the glory of God above all things, and if you hide your name, the name of God, and if you clothe yourself with the righteousness of his Son, then your heavenly Father, who loves his name above all names, will reward you beyond your imaginings, exalt you over you, with loud singing. So, let us all put aside all pride and boasting in self today. Take refuge in the name of God. Bank your hope on the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and not your own. No more self-righteous. Right? What he Ives? And let yourself awaken to the wonder that the Lord, the King of Kings, rejoices over you with gladness and exalts over you with loud singing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We praise you. Because uh, you love us so much, Lord God. 
you let your son die on the cross for our salvation, Lord. And uh, truly, Father, even right now, Lord, we can experience your voice talking to us, Lord God, especially when we uh, study your word, read your word, Lord. Truly, your word, Lord God, becomes alive, Lord, live, Lord God, becomes alive. Uh, Lord Father, we pray, Lord, continue, Lord God, to humble us, Lord God, submit ourselves, Lord God, to your will. And truly, Lord God, we're going to experience your joy, Lord, singing over us, Lord God, when we uh, seek you, humble ourselves, Lord God, and do righteousness. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.